Good afternoon. I uh, appreciate the uh, patience uh, with us this afternoon. We, uh, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, we've got a pretty large crowd of people that have uh, signed up and logged on to, uh, to the webinar this afternoon. Uh, let me start off by welcome, welcoming everybody. Um, we've got about 25 to 30 minutes scheduled for uh, this webinar this afternoon. My name is Scott Riddle. I'm a senior partner with uh, M33 Integrated. I am going to drive this webinar, if you will, for just a little bit, and I'm going to hand it off over to Ken Waldron, who's our Director of Carrier Relations and Procurement. And then I'm going to spend just a few minutes at the very end wrapping up, uh, wrapping up the webinar. <clears throat> Everyone should see the screen change. Um, I'm give give a, just a brief 15-second overview of M33. Uh, we've got a lot of people on the webinar that are not very familiar with M33. Uh, M33 is a third-party logistics provider. We're based out of Greenville, South Carolina. Um, our focus is around providing technology tools and intelligence to help clients reduce cost and automate logistics. About half of our group today uh, are uh, M33 clients. Uh, about the other half is um, are different individuals that we've done some different work with and pro in the uh, process of, of doing some analytical work with. So I appreciate everybody taking some time out of your schedules. So what is the real interest uh, around rail and more specifically around intermodal transportation? Uh, we're going to focus our conversation today more around intermodal. Uh, this is a pretty deep topic, um, and given 25 to 30 minutes, we're going to keep this at a pretty 30,000-foot uh, view. But the real interest uh, is really comes down around money, comes down around cost. We did a survey uh, six or eight weeks ago across several hundred prospects and clients, and it was really interesting to find that uh, consistently in the top five interest points across this group, was intermodal and uh, how they can potentially work intermodal within their supply chain. So we're going to focus most of our effort around understanding that and understanding the real value of what intermodal does within the supply chain. But uh, when it comes down to it, it's really about cost and how can we drive out costs within our transportation span and how can intermodal help us do that. Obviously, we've all been bombarded uh, literally for years um, around tightening truck capacity. And when we think about tightening truck capacity, obviously everyone thinks primarily around truckload. But even more so, we're seeing tightening truck capacity in your LTL markets as well. And how can we bring in a new surface mode, such as intermodal, to help relieve that uh, capacity constraints that we're seeing in both truckload and LTL? And then last but not least, how do we stay competitive? Um, it's really about being innovative within our transportation logistics and our supply chains uh, to create a competitive edge, do things differently, figure out new ways of getting our product to our customers and getting our raw materials in their own warehouses at a lower cost without jeopardizing overall service. And I think what we're going to talk about a fair amount today is understanding uh, uh, the, the, the new strategies um, that, that the rail companies and your intermodal companies have taken over the last several years that have made intermodal uh, a very viable option in many supply chains today where it may not have been a viable option as far back as five years ago. This is a slide, uh, before I turn it over to Ken, this is a slide that I thought was really interesting that really kind of sets the stage for this presentation and this topic. And um, understanding why rail transportation and the use of rail is becoming so, so competitive um, in, in terms of reducing and maintaining freight costs. We see uh, driver wages continue to climb. We see um, uh, truck costs uh, continue to climb. Obviously, we're all monitoring fuel not only on a daily basis anymore, sometimes on an hourly basis, and, and we see that those things climb. But if we look across the railroad, an interesting point is over 30 years, from 81 to 2011, uh, three decades, uh, 
we've seen a 5% increase in rail rates. And I think that really speaks to uh, why shippers and, and, and companies that are looking to incorporate best practices within their logistics operations are really coming back and saying, hey, you know what, I've got to find a new way. I've got to really un uncover and understand this particular mode of transportation and how I can incorporate it within my overall supply chain uh, to, to reduce costs and drive out, drive out uh, inefficiencies. So with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to Ken, and then I'll come back uh, the last two or three slides and just wrap things up. So thank you. Thank you, Scott. Good afternoon, everybody. So we're going to go into the new realities of intermodal. So uh, here's just a quick snapshot of uh, the train uh, being superior to the truck, just for a quick graphic on that. I want to walk you through a framework of where we're going to be taking you here in the next few minutes uh, as an overview, over the road mode challenges and headwinds. Intermodal history, both COFC, which is container on flat car, and TOFC, which is trailer on flat car. So really excluding any discussion about bulk, rail cars, things of that nature, uh, and past shipper reluctance to engage. Rail new realities and value proposition for the shipper and supply chain networks, uh, shipper paradigm shifts to fully embrace the benefits of intermodal, some best practices that we can recommend, and then I'll turn it back to Scott to finish up with some technology and analytics solutions to effect effectively harness uh, the supply chain efficiencies. So just a little levity here, uh, perhaps we can all relate to uh, the traffic congestion problems that we face on a regular basis. This might have been a scene that mirrors your drive into work today. Uh, and it really underscores the point that road congestion and the subsequent delays and obstacles it represents uh, from a freight perspective is a serious challenge to supply chains everywhere. Talk a little bit about over the road mode challenges and headwinds. 20% uh, loss of capacity during the 2009 economic downturn, uh, fleet downsizing, bankruptcies, liquidations, you know, supply and demand have kind of come into equilibrium and carriers have not actively sought out to expand their fleets even though demand has continued to rise in the last three years, uh, the capacity has not ratcheted up to match that. Second bullet, continuing loss of capacity due to increased FMCSA regulations. So CSA and some of the confusion around that, some of the drivers actually being excluded from the valid pool uh, from which carriers can draw. Uh, as a matter of fact, CNN Money website today had a statistic that 29% rise year over year in new home building. That draws drivers out of the market and into construction, so that further puts a uh, damper on hiring capabilities by carriers. Hours of service, talking about reducing that from 11 to 10 hours, which would be approximately 50 miles on a given route, so that would have a significant impact, as well as EOBR, which is electronic onboard recorders. Uh, in 13 or 14, next couple of years, that will be mandated by the government uh, and paper logs will be eliminated. Large carriers are currently migrating away from the traditional or prototypical LTL and truckload that they've always done. Uh, they're not going to continue in those niches. They're instead pursuing dedicated short-haul regional type of operations. And there's been a continued delay of the government investment in infrastructure to accommodate commercial vehicles, although the surface transportation bill just passed. It's unclear about the implications of that measure. Want to turn to rail history and past shipper reluctance to engage. There is a perception among some of the, the transportation professionals that uh, the picture in the upper left-hand corner, perhaps there's inefficient routing connected with rail and intermodal, and then again to the right, uh, disjointed routes. So some of the past perceptions have been slow transit, inconsistent schedules, limited route options, that they can only go coast to coast and the service is only provided between metro areas. However, there's some new realities and viable value add alternatives to over the road which intermodal can present. Which Scott had alluded to earlier, lower transportation cost. Uh, you know, strength in intermodal continues after an all-time high peak just a few weeks ago in week 26. Uh, so it's up almost 6% year over year. 
billions of dollars have been spent in developing rail infrastructure to handle additional volume. So additional track, an example, that's the Heartland Corridor, which we pictured here, which is actually burrowed through mountains to allow double stack trains to go from the Port of Virginia into the customer-rich areas of Chicago, Detroit, Columbus, Cleveland, et cetera. Door-to-door -door service is capable throughout North America, uh, including coming up from the ports of Mexico into the heart of the United States. Transit times are competitive with over the road. A standard service of 600 miles per day are expedited at 800 miles per day. Uh, sustainability, some shippers have targets in terms of um, being able to go green and initiatives that, that they can be compensated for to be aligned with the companies that can provide sustainability. In fact, a gallon of diesel can carry a ton of freight approximately 484 miles. Uh, leveraging of technology to achieve real-time tracking as trains pass through gates, uh, the SATCOM is able to pinpoint their location specifically. And key drainage opportunities for points within close proximity to the designated rail ramps. I want to take you through just a quick example. We, we had success uh, with a current M33 client converting them on a lane from truckload to intermodal and we're able to drive some significant savings for them. So I just want to take you through uh, some of the exercise and some of the numbers here. So it's a lane moving from Burlington, North Carolina to Compton, California, which is the Los Angeles area, about 2,500 miles. So what we've set up here is in the green is intermodal line haul fuel uh, and the total charge and then the corresponding truckload line haul fuel in total. It represents about a 23 percent savings and the, the differential in terms of transit time was only one day, and that would also be dependent upon a cut time. It's possible that those times would come uh, into congruence, and particularly with the hours of service, if that happens to change, that solo transit of five days could actually become six, whereas that does not have any adverse impact on the train. Overall cost per pound on uh, the intermodal option was about 7.7 .7 cents per pound versus 10 cents on truck. And if you extrapolate it over 50 weeks and $931 savings, that would be just under $50,000 as a total realized savings for the shipper. Just to highlight uh, diesel prices and the comparison of truckload versus intermodal fuel surcharge, intermodal fuel surcharge is approximately half of truckload. So what we've designated here is you can see month over month the reaction of diesel prices on the average and the corresponding truckload and intermodal fuels. So as an example, in August about a 48 cent per mile truckload fuel surcharge corresponding 24 cents on intermodal. So even if line haul happens to be the same or very close from point A to point B, uh, there's a true savings to be had strictly on the fuel surcharge side. Some shipper paradigm shifts to fully embrace intermodal benefits, blocking and bracing to protect the cargo. Typically moving down the road, the cargo shifts in a truck slightly at shuffles versus moving over the rails at rocks back and forth. So the appropriate blocking and bracing would need, need to be done. A more effective planning for potential fluctuations and required lead time depending upon the lane and the distance, and then corresponding inventory adjustments as necessary. So how, where do we get started if we want to go ahead and move down the road of, of trying to integrate intermodal into our business? First identify potential products which would be conducive to moving via the rail. Are there any issues related to hazmat, freeze protect, et cetera? And identify and specify candidate OD pairs with repetitive volumes and the corresponding lengths of haul or route distances which are greater than 500 miles. So it doesn't have to be a coast-to-coast -coast move. It doesn't have to be Boston to Los Angeles. It could be something within the interior of the United States. And identify that low-hanging fruit for transportation spend where you can save on intermodal versus moving truckload. Determine the client desired appetite for intermodal transit times and the potential need to carry additional inventory and any resulting cost-benefit trade-off. And then engaging with the service provider if it's a third-party logistics company or intermodal management company, IMC, uh, which effectively meets the value proposition balance of both service and price to coordinate moves with the BNSF, CSX, Norfolk Southern, or UP Railroads. Generally, the BNSF 
and the UP are east-west railroads, and the CSX and nor Northern Southern are moving north-south in the eastern half of the United States. I'd like to go ahead and transition back to Scott. He's going to go ahead and proceed with a deeper dive into technology and analytic tools. Thank you, Ken. I'm going to uh, I'm going to continue uh, with a few things that Ken was talking about there on, you know, what does it really take to move forward? Um, and as you can see the slide, getting on board, um, you know, what are the things that you as a shipper can do to understand really, you know, how viable is this uh, within your supply chain? Um, what are the, what's the true net impact uh, from a cost saving standpoint? And as Ken talked about, what changes and behavior changes within the organization are you really talking about in order to embrace some intermodal transportation going forward? It really starts with uh, intelligence. It, it really starts with evaluating your supply chain. And this is either be, being done internally within your own group of individuals. Uh, for those of you out there that have a 3PL that's managing, um, this would certainly fall within their uh, scope of work um, to bring back to the table a true understanding from an analytical standpoint um, what the viability of intermodal is and understanding and putting those OD pairs together. And when what we find out there in the marketplace is so many companies think of uh, intermodal as an option in regards to their finished goods. And they say, well, you know, it just doesn't fit. We've got uh, delivery schedules. We've got expectations from our customers. And more times uh, than they think, intermodal is really more of an option in regards to their raw materials coming into their, their warehouse. I'll give the, just a brief example. Um, we had a client um, bringing in paper out of Sheboygan, Michigan. And uh, if anybody knows where Sheboygan, Michigan is, you know it's just on the very tip of uh, north of Michigan. And um, they were bringing in this, uh, this paper. It's coming in truckload, three truckloads a week. Um, it's coming in delivered, pricing delivered. So the shipper's paying the, um, uh, the freight and adding the freight to the invoice. And they really started to dive into it and say, look, you know, this is, this is costing us a lot of money. What other options have we got? And they ended up changing the terms, uh, bringing the product in collect, uh, bringing it into Detroit, putting it on a railhead in Detroit, and railing it into, um, uh, into the railhead in, in uh, Charlotte and trucking it. And it was around $900 savings per load. And we're talking about three loads a week throughout the course of the year. And it was just a big, big impact. So the first thing that we recommend, um, you know, shippers to do is to really get into and evaluate their supply chain and do the proper uh, analytics to understand what the value of it is. Um, the second piece of the puzzle I want to talk about a little bit is technology and how do we take that intelligence and then put that into technology to where we can bring this type of information to the point of sale standpoint. And we're going to look at a little bit of that in just a few minutes. Um, Ken talked a lot about understanding and tracking fuel's impact to the bottom line. Ken mentioned a few minutes ago that uh, this is a great slide. Railroads move a ton of freight, 484 miles on a single gallon of fuel. And that's compared to 20 miles via truck. So if nothing else, understanding and knowing what the true impact of fuel is within your supply chain, um, uh, you know, we're talking supply chains of 20, 30, 40 percent of their uh, freight cost is, is involved in fuel. So understanding where that is, real-time metrics to monitor equipment capacity. Uh, we find a lot of shippers that are interested in using intermodal strictly for capacity purposes, um, and there's real-time monitoring. Uh, what is the capacity of equipment uh, within any, any given market? And understanding the capacity on the rail cars. Uh, there's great technology out there uh, to bring that to the surface in a real-time environment. And we certainly encourage, uh, you know, shippers or the 3PLs alike to, to tap into those things. Establish electronic bookings for drayage um, and services of rail car space. Um, a lot of shippers think that uh, uh, managing freight via intermodal, I've got to find a drayage company, then I've got to get it to the railhead, I've got to get it on the car, I've got to track it. All of these things are now door to door. Um, these things are seamless, and there's great providers out there uh, 
uh, that have really got this down to a science, and they've got the ability for you as a shipper and or a 3PL to tap into this electronic booking for that trade service in, in rail car space. Um, in terms of technology, it's it, I talked a little bit ago about turning the information, um, and when we talk about information, we're talking about the rates and transit times, and bringing it to the surface, bringing it to the proper individuals at the point in time in which they're spending those transportation dollars. And this is obviously done through a whole host of different transportation technology products out there. Um, your Red Prairies, your Mercury Gates, um, your JAD, um, all of these guys have got uh, contract management that will accommodate rail rates, will accommodate transit days, will pull this stuff directly from the carriers um, so that so that intermodal now becomes an option in your rate shopping capabilities within your, your technology systems. And so we certainly encourage uh, shippers and 3PLs alike to ensure that their rate engines, that their contract management capabilities will accommodate rail rates um, and, and, and be able to present those rail rates in that real-time environment. Uh, we're looking at just a, a snapshot of, um, of our particular technology um, where we're managing both Hub Group and Schneider Nationals, both international rates, Pacer Global Logistics, intermodal as well, and uh, just bringing that to the surface at the time that you're spending those transportation dollars is what really is going to drive out a lot of the cost and understand what the impact is within the supply chain. I want to say one thing before we end the call this afternoon, and this is about um, a lot of the stigmatism around rail, and, and we speak with a lot of supply chain managers, we speak with a lot of uh, uh, presidents and C-level individuals within organizations. And there is. There is a stigmatism around rail, and there's a fear um, around utilizing the rail. Um, and it's, a, it's, it's, it's justified because there has been a lot of problems over the past in, in terms of shipping via intermodal. Um, but I would encourage you shippers out there to reevaluate and re-understand and understand how a little bit of push back up the supply chain, um, both into production, into customer service, and to truly understanding when your client needs product. Not just when they want the product, but when they really need the product. Because oftentimes that's two and three days difference. And that two and three days difference can mean hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars over the course of a year in freight cost savings. So it takes a little bit of a push back up the supply chain, but uh, a little bit of behavior change within your own organization, a little bit of behavior change within your clients and your vendors can really make a big, big impact uh, at the end of the day. Last but not least, key takeaways. Um, advances in intermodal transportation have really opened this up as an option for many, many shippers. Um, this is not just for coal and lumber um, anymore. This is for uh, short haul. This is for four and five and 600 mile runs, not just for the long haul stuff. And uh, it really opens up this as a viable option today like it never has before. Shippers understanding how to leverage surface modes. Um, surface modes are not just truckload and LTL. Uh, intermodal is a surface mode. And, and, and understanding how to leverage this within your supply chain uh, allows you to outperform the competitors in both service and cost. And again, it all starts with an analytical view. It all starts with understanding where you're at, what options you have within your supply chain to interject intermodal in there um, and bringing forth the right providers, whether it's your 3PLs or whether it's your intermodal management companies, um, bring them to the table and give them a snapshot within your own logistics uh, uh, data for them to really understand and bring to the surface how much of an option this is. Um, with that, I will end it. Uh, again, thank all of you for um, uh, your time this afternoon. I hope this was educational. I understand this was very 30,000 foot view. Um, there's a lot of detail uh, that, that we would certainly love to go over, um, kind of off the call if, uh, if you'd like. But I appreciate you guys' interest um, in this topic. Thank you.